All right. Um, so I guess we get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Before we start, I would like to make a couple of announcements. The webinar is now streaming live on YouTube. You can come back to the event webpage to watch it anytime. I'll put the link in the chat box uh, shortly. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The moderator will direct them to the panelists during the Q&A section. Finally, panelist PowerPoint presentation will be made available later on the event webpage. I hope you enjoy the webinar. With that, I now turn it over to Nicolette Brock, Senior Fellow and Director of Stimson Center Nuclear Security Program for his introduction. Over to you, Nick. Thank you, Trin. Um, as, as Trin said, my name is Nick Roth. I'm the Director of the Nuclear Security Program at the Stimson Center, and I'm also the Director of the International Nuclear Security Forum. For those who are not familiar with the Nuclear Security Forum, uh, that's the uh, project that's sponsoring this event. It's a an international network of uh, non-governmental organizations focused on strengthening nuclear security. And uh, if you're interested in knowing more about uh, the INSF or what we do, uh, we can put that information in the chat box and you can learn more. Um, before going any further, I'd like to thank the Carnegie Corporation to, uh, for uh, sponsoring this event and for their support of the INSF. So, so to begin, the January 6th attack on the US Capitol shocked the world. What perhaps was equally, if not more shocking, was the subsequent investigation into the incident that showed many who participated in the attack were affiliated with the US military or law enforcement. Since then, we've become aware of the growing threat of domestic violent extremism and the pervasive infiltration of potential insider threats within the US government. The Office of the Director of National Intelligence recently released a report stating that ethically, ethnically motivated uh, violent extremists and militia violent extremists present the most lethal domestic violent extremist threats with ethnically motivated violent extremists most likely to conduct mass casualty attacks against civilians and militia violent extremists typically targeting law enforcement and government personnel and facilities. To those of us who work on nuclear security, some of this is not surprising. The insider threat has been long been the most serious and most difficult to address uh, to nuclear facilities. Nearly every publicly documented case of nuclear theft and sabotage at a nuclear facility where the specifics are known was carried out by insiders or with the help of insiders. In recent years, there's been significant progress strengthening defenses against insiders, but clearly more work is needed. Today, we have three outstanding experts to discuss th uh, the threat insiders pose not only to nuclear facilities, but institutions in general and what we can do about it. Our first speaker is Dr. Scott Sagan, the Carolyn S. G. Monroe Professor of Political Science, the Mimi and Peter Haas University Fellow in Undergraduate Education, and Senior Fellow at the Center for International Security and Cooperative uh, Cooperation, and the uh, Freeman Spoli uh, Institute at Stanford University. He also serves as Chairman of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences Committee on National International Security Studies. Our second speaker is Dr. Amy Ziegert, the Morris Arnold and Nona Jean Cox Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and Professor of Political Science at Stanford University. She's also Senior Fellow at Stanford, uh, Stanford's uh, Freeman Spoley Institute for International Studies, Chairman of Stanford's Artificial Intelligence and International Security Steering Committee, and a contributing writer at The Atlantic. And finally, we have Dr. Matt Bunn, the James R. Schlesinger Professor of Practice of Energy, National Security, and Foreign Policy at Harvard University's John F. Kennedy School of Government. His research interests include nuclear theft and terrorism, nuclear proliferation, and measures to control it, the future of nuclear energy and its fuel cycle, and policies to promote innovation in energy technologies. So without further ado, I hand things over to my speakers. Thank you, Nick. Um, I wanted to thank Nicholas Roth and the Stimson team for hosting this important webinar and for also for writing with Rebecca Earnhardt and Brendan Hyatt, a superb article in the January 14th issue of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists on right-wing extremism and nuclear terrorism. 
I hope that they will put that into the chat room for everyone to get a copy. This topic is very timely because of the January 6th insurrection, which should bring to our attention the confluence, the bringing together of two different kinds of insider threats. The insider threat at nuclear power plants and the insider threat inside the US military, reserve corps and among veterans. And there's no one who better uh, exemplifies this confluence than Ashley Babbitt, who was shot as she tried to enter into the House chambers. Um, she's a Q, she was a QAnon believer, served as the an Air Force security airman, that is a guard at uh, military bases in Afghanistan, Iraq, and the United uh, Arab Emirates in active service from 2004 to 2008, then in the Air Force Reserves, and then the DC Air National Guard, where she mentored other guards going overseas. She was increasingly outspoken about her far-right beliefs. And what's clear is that um, very often when there's a, a, a major incident, a, a murder or an insider uh, incident, um, someone will say, oh, he was a quiet man, or she was, so uh, quiet, I would, never would have expected this. Um, Ashley Babbitt was anything but. Uh, you look at her public profiles on Twitter uh, or other sites, she was very open about her QAnon beliefs, uh, indeed tweeting that she was going to go to Washington with uh, QAnon uh, messages, even on January 5th. Uh, what's disturbing is that she's become a kind of hero to the far right now. Websites calling her out for uh, being our first martyr. Uh, many tweets chanting, say her name, Ashley Babbitt. And at least one, however, that I found saying that she was an Antifa spy. The second uh, prominent case is the founder of the Atomwaffen Division, the Atomic Weapons Division, a neo-Nazi group who according to the fall 2020 DOD report to Congress, that group has 80 some members, including at least three identified active military uh, or, um, or reservists, including one who is an active recruiter for the um, uh, AWD, the Adam Waffen Division uh, inside the, the Navy. Uh, this came clear in 2017 uh, when Brandon Russell uh, the founder and his roommate, or his former roommate, Devin Arthurs, confessed uh, to, a, uh, were caught in a murder of their other roommates. And Russell was caught um, driving. Um, and uh, what appears uh, to be, here is a picture of him uh, after his arrest, proudly showing his Atomwaffen uh, division logo tattoo. Um, he had munitions uh, with him and in his garage and had, according to, Devin Arthurs, his roommate, a plan to plan, plan to use five mortars loaded with nuclear materials uh, and explosives, launching them to the cooling units at Turkey Point. Uh, Russell said the damage would, quotes, cause a massive reactor failure and spread irrid, uh, irritated water throughout the ocean. Think about the BP oil spill, except that it wipes out parts of the eastern seaboard. Now, um, you know, regardless of how you think how plausible that attack uh, would have been, whether it would have actually destroyed uh, the cooling systems. Uh, it's clearly a quick danger. And what again is interesting is that he was not a quiet man. When asked while chatting in the now defunct Iron March website in 2016, whether he was worried about being found out during his army uh, basic training, um, he said, and I quote here, I was 100% open about everything with my friends that I made at training. They all know about it. They love me too, because I'm such a funny guy. Now, what this reminds me of is, is uh, earlier cases like Sharif Mobley, uh, who was arrested in Yemen in March, 2010. But what's most interesting about Sharif Mobley as an insider um, was that he was also quite open telling um, his uh, labor union colleagues that quotes, we are brothers in the union, but when holy war breaks out, look out. But again, no one reported him. No one wants 
to be the whistleblower on uh, an individual. And to connect further, the um, nuclear power industry, guard forces, and military, I just wanted to uh, show this slide with a shout out to Katie McKinney, my research assistant who did uh, this excellent work that all of the holding companies that own the more than uh, a large number of nuclear power plants have veteran specific hiring initiatives. You see the percentages at Duke from 10% uh, to uh, TVA at 20%. Um, and although the NRC does publish a insider threat task force report with the best uh, practices guide uh, that you can easily find through the NRC website. It's really disappointing, although not surprising that nowhere in this 39 pages do you find any discussion of extremist views about what could, uh, what you should be looking for. It's really a, a um, bureaucratic uh, exercise uh, the bureaucratic nature of this guidance is seen in its, in its concluding not so clarion call. Departments and agencies should, quote, ultimately comply with all the programmatic requirements and even go above and beyond the minimum standards when appropriate. Now, we have a problem. Um, in response to the Section 530 of the 2020 National Defense Appropriations Act, DOD issued a report that identified the extremists seeking to enlist. Um, it had, uh, uh, I commend that to you and I hope that, that Stimson will put that report uh, onto its website as well. Uh, it has both case studies, such as the ones that I've talked about, uh, not the Babbitt, but the, but, but, uh, uh, the others. Um, it has statistics when available. It even has pictures of tattoos to tell recruitment stations to look out for people who have an atomic symbol uh, tattooed on, on their shoulder, which didn't exist before. But what it doesn't do is to explain not how to identify people at recruitment, that's its focus, but rather how to explain how people become radicalized during and after military service. And that's a very difficult task that we'll be talking about in our session today and I'd like to turn over to Amy, who has done uh, extensive work on this. Thanks, Scott. Let me pull up my screen and we'll pick up where, where you left off. It's really nice to have the band back together from the Insider Threats volume. And I want to thank uh, Nick for uh, inviting me here today to be part of this important discussion. So what I want to do is pick up where Scott left off and, and share with you a case study that I looked at of an insider threat that led to tragedy. And this is the 2009 Fort Hood attack and why it gives us some cautionary tales and some lessons learned for dealing with insider threats within organizations today. So in 2009, on November the 5th, an army major named Nadal Hassan walked into the Fort Hood base in Texas and he opened fire. He killed 13 people and wounded 43 in what was then the worst terrorist attack on American soil since 9-11. And as Scott discussed with his uh, vignettes of, of people involved in the Capitol siege and other cases, Hassan was not quiet either. He was very loud about his growing extremism as he was an army officer uh, during the time that he was uh, employed. Let me just say that he, he did not enter the force radicalized. Uh, he was born and raised in Virginia. He was known as Michael. Uh, he graduated from Virginia Tech. He went to medical school in the army and spent his career as an army psychiatrist. His radicalization is believed to have started in 2001, triggered by the death of family members. And it went over three different postings and six years where he became increasingly vocal and increasingly radical and at the same time flagrantly incompetent at his job. He justified suicide bombers. He defended Osama bin Laden. Uh, he declared his devotion to Sharia law over the constitution. And he so alarmed both his classmates and his supervisors that two of them called him a ticking time bomb and several of his classmates reported him to supervisors. And yet despite uh, these outward signs of radicalization, Hassan got good performance reviews and kept getting promoted. 
A year before this terrorist attack on Fort Hood, Hassan tripped the wire at the FBI. The FBI uh, came into possession of an intercept where Hassan was uh, communicating with Anwar al-Awlaki, uh, a well-known Yemeni-based U.S. radical cleric, who at that time was known as one of the most dangerous uh, virtual uh, sanctioners of terrorism in the world. Hassan, in his initial communication with al-Awlaki, asked whether a Muslim soldier in the U.S. Army who committed fratricide would be, commit, would be considered a martyr in the eyes of Islam. This triggered an investigation by an FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force that lasted just four hours. It was so thin that some wondered whether Hassan was an FBI informant. The FBI investigator on the task force, who was a Defense Department employee, uh, looked through Hassan's performance reviews, uh, found nothing wrong, and figured that his emails to Anwar al-Awlaki must be legitimate research and closed his investigation. So the question here, of course, is what went wrong and why? Most of the reports after the Fort Hood attack uh, faulted individual mistakes, leadership failures, policy gaps, and political correctness about disciplining a Muslim in the military. But I found something very different. I found deep-seated organizational deficiencies that kept both the Army and the FBI from identifying the red flags, aggregating the red flags, and acting on the red flags that could have presented, prevented uh, this insider threat from becoming uh, a disaster. So I'm not, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna talk about the FBI, though I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A. I wanna just drill down on three key systems that the Army had to detect insider threats and why all three of those systems failed in the Hassan case. So on the left side of the slide, you'll see the three system weaknesses. The first of these was the disciplinary system, right? It turns out that Hassan was never disciplined in the time he was in the army, nor was he discharged, which he could have been uh, for espousing the beliefs that he did. And by the way, for his uh, subpar performance. The second possible system for catching the insider threat was the performance evaluation system. And yet Hassan kept getting promoted and he received positive reviews in his official officer evaluation reports that bore no relation to reality. Uh, in fact, the only negative grade that he received in those reports was a failing to take a fitness test. The third system for potentially catching this insider threat was the joint investigation run uh, through the FBI's joint terrorism task forces spread across the United States. But as I just said, this was a shoddy investigation run by the Defense Department representative on the team. This investigator never interviewed Hassan, never interviewed a single colleague or a supervisor and spent a total of four hours searching databases. All three of these systems failed. And the critical question is why? And what I find is that in all three cases, there are deep seated organizational weaknesses that went unchecked. So in the first one, Hassan wasn't uh, uh, disciplined or dismissed uh, because there were incredibly strong disincentives to actually weed someone like Hassan out of the military. I found that at the time there were acute personnel shortages in exactly the rank that Hassan was. He was a captain and then a major. Those shortages were even more acute in the medical services and most acute in his area of specialty, which was psychiatry, because of the growing number of cases of post-traumatic stress disorder inside the military. As one military official put it to me, he said, during that period, everyone was getting promoted. It was impossible not to get promoted. If you suggested it, people would think you were stupid. Removing Hassan would have been very hard. And so the workaround was to transfer Hassan uh, uh, out of uh, Walter Reed. As the officer who assigned Hassan to Fort Hood told his colleague there, you are getting our worst. Now, this same incentive challenge actually appears to exist with domestic extremist groups today. Recruitment goals, we know, are getting harder and harder to fill. Uh, Defense Department data noted in 2017, 71% of Americans in the age range for recruitment, age 17 to 24, 71% of them were ineligible to serve because of fitness issues, educational uh, standards, uh, or criminal records. 
COVID has exacerbated recruitment problems into the military because recruiters can't go onto high school uh, campuses. So asking recruiters to do more to root out potential domestic extremists while hitting those recruitment goals raises big questions of incentives. Right. So that's challenge number one, incentives. Challenge number two, the performance evaluation system. It turns out that the bureaucratic forms that we use uh, encourage or, dis or discourage people from listing red flags. So it turns out that the red flags became invisible. In this case, that officer evaluation form used for promotion wasn't designed to detect any kind of concerning activity of insiders. It was designed to get people promoted. So if you look at these forms, there are little boxes that say yes or no. So the question, does this candidate exhibit leadership? Your choice is yes or no. There's literally no room on the form to put any derogatory information that might be of concern unless you're recommending against promotion. So that's a very high hurdle uh, for somebody uh, to hit in order to uh, recommend against promotion. So these officer evaluation reports were generally a poor reflection of reality for many officers. It turns out that Nadal Hassan was not an exception. He was the rule. These forms by their nature and their form and their function were not designed to uh, aggregate red flags for insider threats. So those red flags existed. There were lots of people talking about them. But when the investigator went to look, he didn't find them because the forms weren't designed for that purpose. There's a connection here to domestic extremism today as well. We know, for example, from that October uh, 2020 DOD report that Scott just mentioned, that security clearances don't actually ask specific questions about domestic extremism, not in the form. There is no clear definition of domestic extremism across the DOD. DOD has no central tracking of allegations or disciplinary actions related to domestic extremism. And, and to the point about veterans, even when people are discharged from the military for domestic extremism behavior, those discharge forms do not have a designation to note the domestic extremism reason, except in the Navy. So in every other service but the Navy, if you're discharged, if you're kicked out of the military for domestic extremism, nothing on that form notes that, right? So the forms matter. Third and finally, the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force investigation. Hassan, as I noted, appeared on the FBI's radar a year before this attack. And it turns out that that one email was the first of 18 uh, communications that Hassan uh, would send to Anwar al awlaki over the next year. Why did this Defense Department investigator do such a bad job? It turns out he was the wrong person for the job and he didn't know what to look for. He came from a uh, part of the Pentagon called the Defense Criminal Investigative Service. This is the organization that does waste, fraud and abuse investigations. This investigator had no counterterrorism training, no counterintelligence training, he didn't know what to look for other than waste, fraud, and abuse. So when he saw that Hassan was using his real name in his communications instead of a fraudulent name, he assumed that Hassan was doing legitimate activity. He also looked through a law enforcement lens. That was his training. He asked whether Hassan had already committed a criminal act, not whether he could be radicalizing to do something bad in the future. He was backward looking, trying to solve a crime or to see whether a crime had been committed, not forward looking, not developing an intelligence threat. This too made good bureaucratic sense. Why did the Defense Criminal Investigative Service send so many people to joint terrorism task forces? Because they were the most expendable, the least mission critical that didn't need to be deployed to war zones. And because they were most like FBI special agents, they were law enforcement, folks with law enforcement authorities. So it made good bureaucratic sense, but it made those joint terrorism task forces less effective. Let me just turn briefly to what some of the implications may be for today. And five in particular, about what Fort Hood suggests about the current insider threat challenge that we face. The first is that individual errors, we often blame individuals when things go bad, but they almost always have organizational causes. 
Um, the second is the powerful role of incentives in creating hidden barriers to collecting and acting on red flags about insider threats. People do what they're rewarded for doing. Recruiters, for example, have contradictory missions by definition. They're supposed to bring people into the military and keep people out of the military. Which mission are they more rewarded for performing? I would bet, though I don't know for sure, uh, that they're more rewarded for their fill rates than it is the number of people that they've actually excluded because of concerns of domestic extremism. So that incentive piece is, is critical. The third, I think, lesson or implication is to beware of decentralization and unit level discretion. There is a tendency to think that decision authority pushed to the lowest level of, uh, of the unit is a good thing. But decentralization inherently maroons red flags in places where they're harder to aggregate. The Military Times last month reported that generally speaking, the services handle white supremacist extremism investigations at the unit level. And there is no requirement to report those investigations up to headquarters. That decentralization by design is preventing red flags from being aggregated. Fourth, you can't find an insider threat if you don't know how to look for an insider threat. Those joint terrorism task forces that I mentioned for Nadal Hassan's case are flawed by design. That Fort Hood investigator had no idea what to look for. And JTTFs are FBI creatures, which means that they are inherently looking for criminal behavior that has already occurred rather than identifying radicalization behavior that could lead to a problem or, or tragedy later. So they are more law enforcement oriented than intelligence oriented. Fifth and finally, I think we're likely to see a lot of calls for policy changes and leadership. This is certainly what happened after Fort Hood with sort of exhortations for leaders to do a better job. But if Fort Hood is any guide, those policy responses won't be enough. Organizational weaknesses like the ones that we see in the Hassan case require organizational solutions to better prevent insider threats. And I'll stop there and turn it over to uh, Matt. All right, thanks very much, Amy. Um, so let me say uh, just a few words uh, about um, where we go from here um, and what should organizations actually do to deal with these kinds of uh, problems. So first of all, as I think you've already gathered, this is really a major challenge. Uh, we've already heard about recent events that make it clear that the risk is to nuclear facilities is very real. Nuclear facilities do have some advantages uh, compared to uh, places that are, for example, just trying to guard information in that you can uh, monitor not only the people, but the uh, areas and the materials that are especially important and the interaction between the people and those areas and materials. Uh, but nonetheless, the threat is very real. But at the same time, People have a right to have uh, weird, or what I would consider a weird view. People have the right to be wrong. People have the right to say things that I would consider reprehensible. And that's what gives me the right to say things that they would think would be reprehensible. Um, and so in dealing with this problem, the nuclear organizations need to balance the political freedom that their staff have successful operations of the facility, mitigating the insider threat, but also other things that they need to accomplish, safety, other elements of security, and so on. Now, there are existing programs in pretty much all nuclear organizations, uh, such as in the uh, military dealing with nuclear weapons, the Human Reliability Program. And these are critical and do make a difference. But as we already heard in part from Amy, they're often not designed really to address domestic violent extremist issues. Now, the US military is working hard to address this issue. 
Um, I was just speaking with some folks uh, from Stratcom this morning who are having uh, four hours of domestic extremism training tomorrow. Uh, but private companies and contractors who are a lot of the staff and guards for nuclear facilities in the United States and in a number of other countries, but especially in the United States, have fewer tools available uh, to cope uh, with these issues. Now, just we've already heard about uh, some cases, but let me mention just a couple of others that are uh, pre-January 6 uh, cases, both from 2019. Uh, Monica Whit was uh, in the Air Force for 10 years doing intelligence. Later, she was a contractor uh, and uh, she defected to Iran and spied for Iran. She helped target US agents and revealed uh, a signals intelligence program. Uh, Lieutenant Christopher Hassan, Hassan, uh, was arrested. Uh, he had spent over 20 years in the Coast Guard. He was planning to kill a range of left-leaning political and media figures. He said he was dreaming of a way to kill almost every last person. Now, in his case, unlike in Monica Witt's case, it appears that he didn't actually use his insider position in the Coast Guard to further his schemes. For the nuclear threat, uh, one recent, uh, well, getting a little less recent now, August 2014 incident was when an insider at the Doal 4 plant in Belgium uh, opened a locked valve, allowed all the lubricant for the turbine to drain out and caused something like $200 million in damage to the plant. Um, to this day, we don't know who did it or why. Um, it was apparently not intended to cause any uh, radioactive release. It was not in a part of a, the plant that could have done that. Um, and so they investigated and they found, gee, this wasn't the guy because he'd left long before, but we had a guy who had access to the vital area and had passed security clearance review for that, who left employment at the plant to go off to fight for terrorists in Syria. Actually, there were two of them who went off to, uh, fight for terrorists and were later convicted. Uh, Bugalab was killed uh, while fighting uh, in Syria. So there are a number of both cognitive and organizational biases that undermine our ability to cope with this insider threat. The insiders, they're trusted people. They're people we've already looked at, authorized, and often they're our friend down the hall, our colleague that we've worked with for years, we aren't mentally prepared often to really think, gee, maybe that person is uh, a traitor to the organization. Um, and so there are a lot of cognitive biases that make us less likely to respond to these red flags. Honestly, uh, in addition to the amazing chapter that Amy wrote on the Hassan case, uh, there's another amazing chapter in the book on the Bruce Ivins case, who almost certainly committed the anthrax attacks in 2001. And those really highlighted to me the extent to which really obvious red flags will sometimes be ignored by an organization. Um, also, oftentimes within an organization, there are uh, many of the kinds of disincentives uh, Amy referred to. I spoke at one point to a person who works with highly enriched uranium at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, actually at the Y-12 facility next to Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And um, he was working with another person uh, on uh, machining highly enriched uranium. And that person had uh, a special skills that only a handful of people at the facility had. But that person started acting in a very odd uh, in concerning way. And so this person I spoke to uh, reported that behavior and the person was taken off access to highly enriched uranium for a few weeks while uh, an investigation uh, proceeded. And the person who reported his boss said, what have you done? You've, you've taken away these special skills. Now we're gonna be way behind schedule uh, and so on. So you can bet that person's not gonna report uh, again uh, the next time. 
So one key element of what organizations should do is don't rely on any one security measure to deal with the insider threat. Insiders, you have to remember, are embedded within the organization. They understand the security measures at the organization. They have months, maybe years to think of ways to overcome those security measures. So don't say, oh, everybody has background checks. It won't be a problem. Background checks can fail. People can be radicalized after the background check, as Scott pointed out and Amy pointed out as well. Um, Human reliability and monitoring programs. Also, often the red flags aren't noticed or reported. Two-person rule sometimes uh, isn't enough. Uh, rules limiting access to certain materials and areas. Those rules can be broken. Often the actual measures that are being implemented on the ground look pretty different than what's in the rule book. So organizations need a comprehensive and multi-layered approach. So a few thoughts on what organizations should do. They should build high performance and high vigilance cultures. You need both at the same time. Everyone needs to understand that security isn't just what those security force guys do. It's part of my job too. Again, a comprehensive multi-layered approach that increases the scale and complexity of the various different challenges an adversary would have to overcome to do whatever you're trying to prevent them from doing. I should include regular assessment, including red teams that, that sort of say, okay, if I were an insider, how would I try to overcome uh, this uh, security arrangement? Um, of course, it needs to be designed within the context of the laws, culture, or of the country and the organization. Uh, and there again, the uh, private companies have a different situation that they're facing than government employees. There were things that, uh, for example, Edward Snowden was subject to when he was a CIA employee that he was no longer subject to uh, when he was a uh, Booz Allen uh, employee. Um, and somehow we need to find ways to maintain vigilance while fostering the kind of trust and cooperation that organizations need to have within the organization in order to perform uh, well. So to have a comprehensive approach at, at a minimum, you need thorough background checks before access, ongoing monitoring after access, including incentives to report concerning behavior and to report a potential vulnerability that you've noticed. Um, effective training, I gotta say a lot of training, you know, those of us with clearances have to get trained, you know, regularly on, on uh, insider threat issues. The training is mostly terrible. It's a list of rules that nobody remembers like a month after they've had the training. Uh, uh, if you tell real stories of how bad things actually happened, people remember that a lot more. People will remember Amy's talk here more than if it wasn't a real story. It was just you know, an analysis of problems. Um, you need to continuously uh, minimize the extent to which human beings get access to the stuff you're worried about in the first place. And then when they do continuously monitor, control, account for everything that goes on in that interaction. And then you need some effective process for investigating when you do get reports, when there is some concerning issue. And that needs to be seen as fair and reasonable by the staff. Because if the staff believe that reporting means their buddy is gonna get instantly fired without any fair investigation, then they're not gonna report. Um, what you need is to actually integrate the system with the employee assistance program so that what might be the result when you report is that uh, somebody who needs help gets help. I was... Uh, talking with a person uh, from the US nuclear industry, we were doing some training on insider threat issues. And he said, every person in this room from our industry can uh, honestly say that they've at least once saved a life because of their reporting. Um, so then what should we do about this as a country uh, about the domestic extremism issue? First of all, I do think 
as the House voted uh, last year, but didn't make it into the final NDAA, that we need a national commission on terrorist threats generally, foreign and domestic, and our responses. Because I think at the moment we're still imbalanced with uh, more attention on the foreign threat and too little on the domestic threat. Uh, there is an insider threat program at the federal level that was established after the Manning and Snowden incidents. Uh, we need to expand and reprioritize that so that domestic violent extremism is a key element and offer direction and guidance to federal agencies about what to look for, how to manage the problem. Uh, we need to review and modify our insider threat programs at the key agencies that are overseeing nuclear operations, Department of Defense, Department of Energy, Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And we need to figure out how can we get similar protection against insiders, whether they're working for the federal government or whether they're working for a private contractor. We're not gonna be able to do exactly the same things, but if we can, we need to find comparable protection for comparable roles and levels of access. That might mean more assistance to private companies from the government, more authority for private companies, but it, it just shouldn't be true that we're using people from private companies in sensitive situations where we can't have the level of insider threat protection that's required uh, for that role that they're in. And I will uh, stop there. Thank you all. That was a phenomenal discussion uh, about the challenges that we face on insider threats and uh, some potential solutions for addressing those challenges. We have a number of questions. I have questions of my own. I'm going to defer to the audience uh, and, and maybe uh, add a question of my own at the end. Um, but I'll, I'll start with um, a question, an interesting question about social media. Um, are are you aware of any nuclear energy industry associations encouraging companies to ask for the social media handles information slash information in job applications, or are there any U.S. privacy laws preventing companies from doing so? The same for their current employees. And let me expand that a little bit. Um, what you know, in an, in an a, a age where there's just an enormous amount of information to sift through, how do you think nuclear facilities, whether private or uh, government, should be addressing the issue of social media, uh, financial transactions, all of the information that's out there. Uh, that's for any of you. Well, I think it's a troubling issue, um, especially again for the private companies. Um, uh, it raises privacy concerns at the same time as it's an obvious set of information uh, to look at. And I don't have a brilliant answer. It seems to me in the long run, we're gonna be ending up in a situation where um, we need um, some kinds of automated systems to scan through some of this kind of stuff if you want to have a job that involves sensitive aspects of nuclear weapons, materials, facilities, information. I'll just jump in a little bit to add to what Matt said. It's a great question. Obviously, there are privacy concerns, but the reality is that we are in an open source world uh, where there's a great deal of information available about all sorts of threat actors, insider threats among them. Uh, and our adversaries are going to be using this open source intelligence to greater effect. So this is an urgent need, not just for nuclear sec the security of nuclear facilities, but for our US intelligence community more broadly to understand how we can balance concerns for privacy with concerns for security using open source information, including on social media to identify threats uh, before uh, they become acute. So the, a bit much bigger problem. Automation is certainly in our future. Um, and, you know, given the fact that Google can figure out what shoes I wanna buy, certainly we can figure out uh, patterns of behavior uh, before they become um, more acute. Uh, and more serious. Uh, and the question is how to do that responsibly and true to our values. So uh, another question we have, uh, no, uh, another really interesting question is there's a, a concern from one uh, uh, 
uh, audience member about uh, potential uh, threats in, in Turkey with the development of their first nuclear plant. And uh, it occurs to me that um, a lot of the discussion that we've had is uh, uh, US domestically focused. And I guess um, what lessons, and I obviously we could do a whole other session about this, but if there's one or two uh, key lessons you think are important for uh, other countries that might face similar threats, what do you think those would be? Well, I want to just give a shout out for the World Institute for Nuclear Security uh, in Vienna. Um, so um, this is a private organization that uh, brings in members to discuss um, not just um, best practices, but errors that were made or near misses. And they've held many meetings uh, trying to publish uh, their work, which is, is open. But the, the, I think perhaps greatest contribution is not in their publications in setting up guidelines. It's actually in the one-on-one -on -one or small meetings that they hold. Uh, Matt and I have attended a number of them over the years and have found that um, in the security space, even more so than the safety area, um, international actors don't want to um, air their dirty laundry. But what they are willing to do is to talk about a problem with a colleague who's another manager of a facility in another country um, and I've seen that process work and it works very effectively. So whether you're uh, the Turkish regulator uh, or the UAE uh, program that's up and running, you, you wanna get involved in that kind of organization um, so that you don't just try to learn from your own mistakes, but you learn from other people's mistakes. I, I would, uh endorse uh, Scott's uh, shout out for wins. I would also say that the issues we've talked about today are issues for a large number of countries. Uh, certainly, uh, I, practically every country in Europe uh, has uh, a lot of these same issues. And if, you, if it's just domestic extremism, almost every country has its own version of what the, what the domestic extremism problem is. Um, uh, and so I think it's an issue for Turkey, but I think it's an issue for uh, a lot of countries uh, around the world. In the case of Turkey, their nuclear power plants are going to be owned and operated, and I believe protected by Russia. Um, uh, and so that a, a, adds another uh, different uh, picture. My, one of my bigger concerns there is uh, effective regulation and just the power imbalance between the Russian government, you know, owning the reactor, knowing everything about that reactor and so on, and a new nascent nuclear regulator uh, strikes to me as potentially worrisome. Another interesting question we have um, is about uh, clearance investigations um, and what role they can play as gatekeepers to potential insider threats. The uh, the audience member asks, are, uh, what are the impediments to their usefulness uh, for that purpose? Are they too infrequent, uh, not designed to identify domestic extremist behaviors or mechanisms, mechanisms for triggering inquiry when uh, issues arise? Um, what do people think about the, uh, the clearance process? Well, I'll jump on that one, Nick. Um, as Matt and, and Scott have pointed out, this October 2020 DOD report is chock full of really good information. And one of the things that they point out in that report is that clearance investigations ask questions that are far too vague to be useful. So they ask, for example, how, you know, whether you're um, engaged in terrorism. There are not specific questions about domestic violent extremism. And that report includes recommendations of specific changes to questions on that uh, security clearance SF-86 form uh, to get better answers. So you'd be amazed at what people will tell you if you ask them, right? You just have to ask the questions in a more fine-tuned way to get better data going in. A second challenge that, that, we, that I found in, in, the, in the Fort Hood investigation is that updating those clearances. So the reinvestigation process, 
uh, needs to be uh, uh, improved as well. So there is often a, a big lag between them. And again, to the point that, that Matt and Scott have made so eloquently, people don't wanna rat out their friends, right? So the hurdle is high. Um, even in a security clearance reinvestigation, you don't want your friend or your colleague to lose their clearance because you've said something about them unless you're really, really alarmed. So we have to work with that natural human behavior to resist adding things in that process that actually could be very useful. I would also say the reinvestigations are every five years. And as uh, a lot of data have indicated, uh, radicalization happens way faster than that. And um, so um, we really need measures uh, for ongoing monitoring in between the reinvestigations. So uh, another question from uh, my colleague, Will Toby. In the examples given, the insiders have been lone wolves or nearly so, receiving inspiration but not support from others. An individual backed by a network or an organization would seem to pose a much more sophisticated threat. Are there special measures we should consider to address such threats? Well, Will, I would just note that that Brandon Russell was not a, a, a lone wolf. He surrounded himself, he had you know, the four men living in this apartment together were all members of this group, which according to the DOD report has some 80 people. You know, they don't know the exact numbers obviously because it's gone um, uh, even more underground than it, than it was uh, before. Now, you know, we have to balance when we do design basis threats, you, you wanna have a protection mechanism. You make a choice about what the uh, threat is, and then design your security system around that. Um, in the nuclear safety area, people have thought a lot about beyond design basis threat. If there's something that you think is an extreme low probability, but very extreme danger, shouldn't you have some of your resources devoted to beyond your design basis threat? Um, and I think in this nuclear space, especially when there are radical organizations, not just lone wolves, you've got to actually think about beyond design basis threat thinking for nuclear security. Well, and I would say that um, right now, uh, it's in the design basis threat for in the United States anyway, that an insider might be connected with an outside uh, group that might be uh, trying to steal nuclear material or trying to sabotage a nuclear power plant uh, or what have you. Um, uh, and that's a very difficult threat to cope with. I, I am hopeful that a number of the measures that I outlined would help, but it, it's, a, it's a tough, tough challenge. The other challenge that um, you have to worry about is uh, which is not so much in our design basis threat right now is, you know, people make friends and you could end up with two, three, four insiders within a facility. And that's really tough. Um, I have a, a bit of a different view, which is I think from an intelligence perspective, the lone wolf threat is in some ways the toughest test. So if you're designing for lone wolves, you're better off when you're talking about organizations because lone wolves are harder to identify. They're harder to track. Organizations leave bigger footprints, right? They meet together. They have, you know, bureaucracies. They have more telltale signs of what of their behavior. So I tattoos. think in some ways that we're that we're we're sampling on the dependent variable in a useful way, right? If we're picking on only those cases of the toughest cases, which are the lone wolf cases, we're more likely to get cases where there are organizations involved. Excellent. And um, I'm, I'm seeing that we are uh, coming close to our time, but we have an enormous amount of questions, which makes me think um, we should perhaps have a sequel to this event where we can get to all of these questions. Um, but I'm, I'm going to uh, 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 take the last question, which is, this is an issue that's being discussed in Congress right now. This is obviously a major issue for the White House and uh, various uh, departments within the federal government. 
if each of you could make one recommendation to, uh, you can pick the audience, whether it's the executive or the legislative branch uh, to implement over the next uh, months or years, what would that one recommendation be? Well, I would say uh, of the several that I offered, the probably the most important is for each of the organizations that are dealing with uh, nuclear operations, the Department of Defense, the Department of Energy and the NRC to seriously think through their insider threat programs and modify them to reprioritize the uh, domestic uh, extremist threat uh, as part of their insider threat programs. My one rec rec recommendation is a little um, out of the box in that I think it would be very useful for senior leaders to model behavior in this way. Um, yeah, I, I was struck in the early period when the US was helping so much with uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and nuclear security there, how leaders got away with all sorts of things, whether they were uh, Russian leaders or American visiting commissions um, being waved through. And I think to, to model the kind of behavior that we want, um, I think it's shocking that you would let a Congress person carry a gun or refuse to go through um, security. And if you tried to model what is appropriate at the senior level, where it probably really isn't necessary, it becomes more normal and more acceptable uh, at lower levels. Okay, so Scott has now inspired me to be out of the box. I'm going to suggest something that may seem tangential, but I don't think is. One of the critical issues to dealing with insider threats uh, across different organizations is the FBI and its law enforcement orientation. Uh, as long as the FBI is a law enforcement oriented organization, not a domestic intelligence agency, we will be playing catch up on insider threats across the country. So if I had to suggest one reform to generate dramatic cultural and organizational change in the Bureau, this is gonna get me a lot of uh, enemies in the Bureau. It's enable analysts to run FBI field offices. As long as only agents who carry guns get to rise through the ranks of the Bureau and run those all important offices, analysis and intelligence will be given short shrift. Excellent. Well, thank you to, uh, this, our, the, uh, to our panelists. This was a phenomenal conversation. I have no doubt it will continue amongst our audience members and amongst uh, uh, the, the panel as well. Um, thank you everyone for coming and, and have a great day.